Hello, world. It is I, one of the Kyles. Um, today, I am joined by a very special guest. Um, one, some might say, uh, is legendary from the 70s. Uh, today, I'm joined by Luke Skywalker. Hi, Luke. How are you doing? Not too bad. Pleasure to be here. That's fantastic. I'm happy to have you. Um, and I'm going to leave the Q&A up now because I'm going to ask you some Q's and hopefully you'll give me some A's. Um, so the, the, the future, from my perspective as an MSP, um, is always daunting and varied. It's, uh -oh. it's, it, this is definitely it's something like wrong in this room. Ray said, um, <laughs> so I don't know what that means. My stuff looks good, but that doesn't mean it is good. <laughs> well, until he says otherwise. Yeah, until he says otherwise. It's going to just be like, I haven't heard the entire conversation for the past 20 minutes. Oh, well, um, so from an MSP perspective, uh, the my perspective is different than another MSP's perspective who may be a different size and a different... Uh, we may use different products or may use have different policies and procedures. You are a completely different source from that because you are a product manager for one of the major vendors in our space. Is that correct? That is correct. I'm not here with my product manager hat on, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, well, I've, I've done my time. I've, I've worked for a couple of system integrators back, back in the day in, in Australia, New Zealand region. I, most of my IT career has been spent uh, vendor side. Uh, spent 16 years or so working on Commvault, so doing backup disaster recovery across APAC and then across um, the world. And then before I started shifting around a little bit of time at Kaseya, worked at a cloud management startup, and then just this year shifted over to Data to work in the RMM team. That is an interesting journey, definitely. Um... Backup is a fun place. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it drives you insane, but it's, it's a fun uh, place. <laughs> I, I was going to say, it doesn't seem like it'd be, it just seems very tedious and not very fun. Uh, you guys got to, because you got to get a dot your I's, cross your T's constantly. That's not a accidentally installing a wrong piece of software in a client machine. will probably not, no one will probably really care. You just uninstall it, but you not having someone's backup and that that's a completely different scenario. Uh, you learn to love speeds and feeds and numbers, particularly when you design for um, design for scale, like say a 1.5 or a 2.5 petabyte a year with a 30 uh, 30 say yearly growth uh, backup environment. Like that's that's where I think the if you were to do backup, that's that's where the interesting fun is. But obviously, I'm not here as a backup person now. I'm here as an RML, as an RMM person. <laughs> but uh, uh, it, it's it's it, I think it's just it's interesting because like this this is definitely a time to be alive, and it's what MSPs can go off and do these days is always fascinating. Like MSP the industry has always been of interest to me. And I think what you can go off and build and do these days is just getting more varied and, uh, and, and interesting. It's no longer, okay. It's always just a server. It's always just a virtual machine. Like that there is so much more to go off and solve and do. I would a hundred percent agree. The MSP space is, uh, almost like a it, the the entire space is almost like a startup software company where just things are constantly changing and it's it's just like everyone has different ideas and then they have the ability to execute those at different ideas and it is because i grew up when backups weren't a thing like you were using tape drives and semantic backup exec and and then Datto came on the market and was like cloud backups put the thing on there press the button it works and it did for the most part um and then you had Veeam coming out and you had all these fantastic things. And now it's just like, you just have backups. Like it's not a thing anymore. You don't have to worry about selling it to the client. You don't have to worry about what system you're going to utilize. And if they have tape drives and you get to worry about cycling tapes, that's just, here's our solution. Use it. <laughs> I mean, like it's, it's, it's a lot such of tape a There's a lot of tape out there. You just don't see it anymore. It's, it's, oh, uh, that's true. it's, it's true. Spectralogic just put out a new unit that like dwarfs the the original storage tech SL eighty five hundreds and LTO sevens around the corner. But now you know it is something like say I don't know AWS Glacier or uh, Azure Cold Cold Storage. Like <laughs> these oh, things yeah. are yeah. a little bit more abstract. They renamed them to be more modern. It's giant tapes. 
You know, but someone it, should invent like a like a, a cassette tape, just like that's as big as like a house. So you just you slot that in there, and then you back up to that. That would be cool. I'd be cool with like a retro futuristic tape drive. That's a little bit too nostalgic for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you don't know, like just, programming on a Commodore sixty four with a little tape as that just. I was just, just like at some point somebody's going to say bring back a jazz drive or bring back a zip disk, and I'm like no oh, zip discs. <laughs> zip discs. The uh, man, I, I, we had one at my old company, and I remember seeing it going, ah, zip disk. I've never used one, but I know what it is. Uh, because they were just in and then immediately out. <laughs> it's a, uh, it's a great bit of technology. I love uh, older technology. Just, it's just fascinating watching. You know, looking at how Commodore came up and how Atari did, and beginnings of the PC and IBM and stuff like that. So, it's always a fun history lesson to do. Uh, but unfortunately, we're not here to talk about retro tech as much as I would nope. love to just dive deep into retro tech. And I'm sure some people would actually pay to watch that. Um, we're here to talk about managed service, technical service providers, or managed service security providers, and any other acronym that you can tag onto our space. Um, so currently, this entire talk is about the future of the managed service space, and it is is beelining towards what could probably be considered to be the most likely space that it's headed to and uh the methodology of how to make sure that i'm pivoting my business and i'm pivoting myself to be better accurate in that space is always a question um, that comes up and in this rapidly evolving space that's something you always want to think about so what do you see where do you see the market headed? So that gets really kind of interesting um, because we know the technology is not standing still. Um, you can look back over the, the course of services gone by, uh, say the hosted exchange business of the 2000s, particularly through the Europe region. Mm, rack space. Uh, but not just rack space, like uh, you had tens or hundreds of MSPs spread across EMEA. Uh, and they were all doing hosted exchange mm -hmm. because me, me is an interesting market. Like you, you know, French uh, French companies only want to do business with French MSPs and same in Germany and the same in the Nordics and the Benelux region and then UK and I. And so um, these regions that were simply just taking an existing technology and offering it as a platform, you know, was, was good business, but then the technology moved, the offerings moved. And so it, it's, it's like we've always been in this constant shift of, uh, always searching for the next higher value thing to do. Like as you, as one thing comes in, like Office 365 or the predecessor to that, which was BPOS, um, of, you know, BPOS and Office 365 mm -hmm. solved a lot of problems, but they also then created new, new, uh, new problems to go off and chase. And I think one of the most interesting things that this chase towards not just Office 365, M365 and SaaS has been uh, user experience management is something that was at the, the edge. And I think it's actually starting to appear a little bit more now. I mean, when you think about it, like who hasn't had a client ask, what have you done for me lately? And this was a lot easier when it was just about the endpoint. Uh, but it turns out that's a little bit of a coincidence because when you delivered a really, really good desktop laptop experience, um, all the benefit was because the workload, like the application, the data, everything was on that machine or it's within that small office. You know, when you did a really good job with that hardware and you did a really good job with that network and the power, then you'd have a really fantastic user experience. And, you know, what have you done for me lately? Well, you made my QuickBooks, you made my MYOB, you made my AutoCAD sing. Like you're doing the great job. But of course the workload's fragmented. You know, shared word docs sitting in SharePoint on a commodity internet link through a thick client or web browser between three people. We still need to ensure that a well-running machine um, is up is uh, accessible and there, but it's not what constitutes a good uh, user experience anymore. So you feel um, that the market's moving towards less of an endpoint focus and more on a business focus. So how do I solve your QuickBooks issue from migrating data or to automate this process via the tools that like Microsoft have with the power framework and stuff like that. So you feel it's moving more towards the setup and maintenance of those tasks 
versus installing Windows updates and Windows patches? It's always been about the business process. It's just happened to be that to make that, that business process or to make that, that business value come to reality, it's been as easy as make the desktop sing. Um, but as a lot of these things are no longer, uh, I mean, you pick up a machine and your user remembers the application in a tab in Chrome. They don't know that much about the desktop, like the value, the intrinsic value that that desktop and everything else underneath it delivers is very invisible. So they don't care about it until it breaks. Um, and it's, it's kind of interesting. Like uh, I remember hearing some some commentary uh, that like Microsoft 365 had a had a bad day, and uh, the client called the MSP and said, "Hey, you know what's going on with Microsoft 365? We know it's not your fault. Like you're not Microsoft. We just want to know that it's you know, is there a problem on the M365 side so they could adjust their expectation. So it's interesting that. Um, what it takes to sort of deliver that is is getting kind of kind of interesting because initially back in the day before um, N365 really took off, you saw that there used to be a lot of MSPs, um, particularly in say ANZ area, because internet connectivity is a huge problem down there. It still is to an extent this day. They would fight the SaaS delivery model because not because um, uh, not because it wasn't delivering the same good product, but because, hey, we can't control the experience, we can't control latency, we can't control performance. Like, how do we make sure that the user's always going to have a good time? Mm -hmm. And obviously that didn't work out. But we can see other areas of the, of the tech space where um, really good work's being done to better understand this. Um, so let me paint an interesting picture. Like, you look at, uh, say, Ubiquiti Gear lately. One of the things they really did that was really kind of fascinating in the V5 interface was they started rating. I don't know if they did it in the prior one, so you'll have to excuse me. My experience with them has been V5 forward. They started to score satisfaction per device. They do some some basic rudimentary work, like measuring uh, acknowledgement packets, flying back and forth between a, a wireless client and between the access point, and then going out the door through the USG to the internet. But they're able to start quantifying and saying, hey. You've got this one laptop that you, know, you probably know belongs to your CIO in the corner of the office, and he's not having a good time. Like, he's got maybe a 60% satisfaction score, you know, which means 40% of his packets are being dropped. So you probably want to go and, and sort that out. And uh, that kind of stuff is interesting. I don't think it goes far enough, but I think a few, uh, a few more enterprising MSPs are starting to cotton onto the idea that um, it's time to start. The SLA in itself is not enough. If they want to be seen as delivering superior value, they need to actually start scoring the experience itself. Uh, one term I've heard from um, around is the, the concept of, of an XLA. So a user experience level agreement uh, where they're starting to effectively quantify um, the experience individual users are having and then looking at that in terms of um, availability and other correlated statistics to then say, did we actually make sure that a good service was delivered to the best of our ability? Don't just make sure that we responded to tickets in a good time, but can they access their apps on time? Can they do other things? And that's... That's an interesting thought process um, because it, I mean, SLA's been sort of about constantly. It's like, how quick could we get to the ticket? How quick did we resolve it in very few cases? Um, but some people support how long it's going to take to resolve an issue, which more power to you. Um, so yeah, because because it's not something you, you traditionally look at, right? I mean, yeah. you normally we normally think of statistics when from an infrastructure perspective of CPU and memory and paging and all the rest of it. But in this kind of concept, those performance statistics are actually kind of meaningless. And I know you probably don't specifically know, but how? What would you measure? Like, obviously, you, you'd include certain stats, like how long it took for us to respond, how long it took us to resolve the ticket. Um, but what other statistics and measurements have you would you use or have you heard of using to, to measure that XLA? The most common ones I've seen are some of the most obvious ones. So uh, NPS. Um, I hate NPS. Yeah, I mean, I mean NPS is, is, the problem is, is that NPS can be overused. Um, MPS is you know, your net promoter score, which is simply, you know, how much do you like us or would you recommend a zero to 10, which yeah. is, it's meant to be a lagging indicator to tell you whether you should investigate closer or not. Um, there are some experiments being done out there to look at, 
combining and then adding weighted scores to MPS and then other key metrics across the service desk. But I think where a lot of this eventually is going to go because uh, with a lot, uh, you've got some commoditized data services coming down the pipe, you know, you're seeing this in security through Azure Sentinel, but there's other places where um, people are starting to experiment with actually measuring um, the responsiveness of endpoints. Like, can we see, uh, can we see if a particular application perhaps is just hanging a little bit more than it should? Or um, are we perhaps seeing uh, a connection starting to uh, flap or a port, you know, port flapping on a switch? And that's, that's, that's an interesting perspective. Um, hmm. and it's something I haven't even thought about, but it's, it, 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 it would take a lot of different tools to, to work together to, to effectively quantify the XLA, but it's certainly doable in today's market to be able to, uh, check your, your firewall and your switching to see if there's any lag time between packet switching or uh, if there's difficulty hitting DNS or, you know, that you can, you can pull that data to, to quantify from a larger perspective, not necessarily an individual's perspective, but you can say company A is, is experiencing degraded services. Um, and yeah, because I mean, like, like, like imagine an interesting scenario where you take, say, um, you, you're crunching a very heavy Excel spreadsheet. You know, it's going to chew up four CPUs um, to go do the work. But uh, just because the CPU is pegged at 100% across all four cores, is it necessarily the machine's in trouble? No. But if Excel itself starts to crash a little bit more or it's hanging a little bit more than it should or it takes a little bit longer to load certain things, like that then becomes, and then combine that with perhaps some actual real data from the user, then you start to get in an interesting place because I mean, stability is important, but the user perception of the, the performance. I mean, how many times have you seen a ticket that says, I feel like my machine is running slow? And you check the metrics and the CPU is like 20% and memory is like 40 if you're lucky. Yeah. <laughs> but they're like, hey, this machine is slow. I want a new machine. Like problem's not your machine. It's the application or the service that your network connection had a bad day or somebody took a backhoe through a link three states over and, you know, everything's being rerouted right now. Yep. So that gets that gets interesting. I think once you start to see, um, it's, it's going to take some of the builders out there, you know, whether it's done on an MSP or a vendor or some of the more interesting uh, cloud vendors start making it easier to extract the information and Here then go. correlate it. Geek business idea of the week. XLA Sorry? metric gathering. Hmm. And present it, just API everything. Just present me all the data and then give me an XLA score. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's because hard, that, that's, that's the hardest problem, right? Is just getting the data out is actually like three quarters of the battle. Once you've got the data, you can do a lot of interesting things, but you've got to get the data first. And But uh, like, like ima imagine walking into a, uh, you walk into the QBR with your client and you can turn around and put a heat map on the wall and say, hey, look, you know, we're, we're making sure that all of your divisions, all of your teams are running great, but we're noticing that you've got a couple of key problems with this one subsidiary or this is one office out of here. And two out of three times, they've got a huge amount of problems. They may not be logging them in service tickets or sometimes they do log them, mm -hmm. but hey, this is a big problem because it means, you know, they're not able to be as uh, productive as you think they might be. And now here enters the conversation and talking about, an upgrade project or a let's go put in a secondary link or let's go upgrade the firewall because it's not coping with the amount of throughput going through it like that kind of level of insight where you're thinking about you're being that next level of being proactive like that's a way he can really drive a data informed decision but there's some steps that need to get there but i, I think we'll see some interesting experiments run first you know some will there'll be interesting lessons learn out of them but uh it, yeah it makes a difference I think that's going to matter more and more as we get to the future because what's my latency to my office app? What's my latency to my cloud web app? What's my latency to my backup appliance? That's cloud. I mean, like everything is, I, I mean, I've always said this, but we're, we're, we're moving in towards everything is going to be cloud and we're actually going to experience the internet of things. It's, you know, it's 10 years past when everything was going to be the Internet of Things, but we're now actually being able to do it with everyone having APIs and everyone being able to digest oh. those APIs. And we're going back to the 90s where you basically rented machine time from someone else. And it's just a little bit more easier to access and do because they have a lot more machines than they did back then. 
it, it'll um, probably actually get more complicated than that. I mean, there's advances in edge computing, which mean that you're going to be able to uh, offload some functions to a piece of compute in a cell tower. I think that's already a beta service here in the US, which means that Office, you know, for example, an Office 365 core service could potentially not just be in a data center in, say, US East, it could also be in your local cell tower, which means when something goes wrong, you've now got to trace, is it a problem with their commodity router? Is it their PC? Is it their LAN? Is it the local cell tower? Is it actually the cloud service? I got to check status.azure, status two, status three. Like and those may not be right. <laughs> <laughs> There'll be more work, not less. Let's yeah. put it that way. That that's always a short through any in anybody's career, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I mean, it's it's definitely you know, and I've had this conversation with several of, of the members of the community is is that uh, project work and endpoint work are going to be much more separated, and it's going to be more towards project work, such as doing the Intune and the Power Automates, and setting up businesses to business versus setting up endpoints to business, right? Because you, you can have Intune automatically deploy patches whenever you want. They get a virus, you just press a button and it wipes the entire machine, spins it back up mm -hmm. like a Windows deployment service, but it's cloud-based. And it's, it's you have these fantastic tool sets that it, it'd be a shame if you did, as an MSP if you didn't at least start taking advantage of that where you can. Obviously, it's not a, you can't just hit a switch and then boom, everyone's got into it, right? Um, so, you know, it, it'd be a shame if you weren't exploring those options to be able to better serve your customer base, but it's also an interesting perspective from those who use RMM tools and those who heavily use RMM tools, such as my company. Um, we, we have, I'd say we probably abuse our RMM tool um in several different ways it probably wasn't designed to do but it gets what done what we need to do and we are more effective with it but as everything is transitioning out it's it's a it's an interesting landscape i think that that that's the true tale for any technology is is uh yes there is the use cases on the team but there's whatever you want to do on top of that you just make it work right <laughs> <laughs> exactly uh you give me an api and i'll i'll make wonders happen um as long as you can digest my data, we'll have a good day. Uh, and but I mean, it's a, it's an interesting perspective because Intune's gonna redundant a lot of the standard features our MM tools have, so they'll have to adapt and better make use of things that Microsoft fails at making, um, which are the MSP user experience. Um, as an MSP managing multiple tenants is not the best system. Um, it could definitely be better in a lot of cases and. That's that's where I think a lot of the RMM tools of the future need to or would be pivoting to. Um, yeah, it's like it's like a natural evolution when you think about it. Like you you turn back and you look at technologies that used to be discrete, like um, dedicated snapshot management technologies. Um, whereas now VSS is built into every Windows machine. You've got similar technologies across um, LVM2, ZFS, everything else. But it used to be like one piece of tech. You'd pay 50, 60 grand for a license to go solve that one discrete niche problem um the same for for uh uh file archiving because sas storage used to be you know like a scuzzy uh scuzzy uh, nine gig disk used to be super expensive so you'd want to spool that stuff off into lower grade well now that's just built in and free i think intune simply just doing yeah you know, it's a different perspective on what they're trying to solve mm -hmm. um but i think it's just the next evolution forward like the next problem to solve is a little bit over to the right. Yeah. And so it's incumbent on, it's not just an RMM, I think it's like, it, this goes for any vendor space. Yeah. Um, don't build me a better tool, go, go build me something that solves this high value problem. This is already, this is now solved and this is standard and this is commodity. Go shift over and fix this yeah, next like thing. Like Windows Defender and AV companies. Like that's a that's a major concern for AD, AV companies because Windows Defender is a pretty good AV and it's there. <laughs> it's, it's included in my Microsoft license that I, hopefully paid for um and it's it's an interesting like i think that's why i think the market is moving more towards edr agents and breach detection after the fact you know and remediation um and not necessarily you know uh behavioral detection and not necessarily uh md5 detection you know like uh mapping well, it's yeah, like it's an extent, it's like an extension of the old mantra, you'll mess for less. Like we'll manage this problem for you because we're experts at it. Like NDR is to solving the next problem after any uh, after a virus is detected. And so 
you look at a lot of these solutions are just solving that next problem forward. And you know, MSPs are always at that forefront of like, okay, what's the next problem that can be solved that's not quite perfect or it's high touch or it requires human intellect or human decision to be made like that space is always shifting, but that's where the MSPs will always have an edge over even a Microsoft Azure or a, a AWS. That's certainly for sure. Yeah. Uh, as Nightwolf uh, clearly pointed out, it's uh, Windows Defender is useful if that has internet access. It can be fairly useless without cloud detection, which I would argue uh, any AV is fairly useless just in general um, these day, this day and age. Uh, and most of them have a cloud access uh, requirements, like I mean, WebRoot's mostly cloud. So, I mean, at this point, it'd be debating slight semantics and mine's free and I don't have to pay for the other one. Like that's, that's, that's at the end of the day, the, the most important key feature is you're giving me the same thing I'm paying for. Why would I pay for it? Right. Um, yeah. And if, and if as a client, I'm taking, I'm making use of the business premium license, which gets into why would I take advantage of it? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I wasn't sure if you went muted for a second. <laughs> the screen just went blank for a moment. <laughs> uh, no, I, my dogs are going crazy because they heard something. And I, I don't know if you can hear it. I don't know if the stream can hear it. But if there is, welcome dogs to the stream. I can't They're not coming on camera, me. though. I'm not doing that. <laughs> unless, you, unless you gift sub like 50 subs, then I'll do it. Um, There's the hook. Yeah, that, that's how we get that's how we get money in MSP Geek. Um, but uh, it's it, user experience is, is is super important, um, and I think all the big vendors can can make the play for user experience from the MSP side to be able to manage these multi tenant applications because it's a nightmare. It can be a nightmare to be able to rapidly do what we need to do to be successful in our business. Um, so that brings up the other crooks of the matter of the rapidly changing managed services space is what we would consider non-traditional services. Yeah, this, this is this is sort of an interesting one. Um, just to, to paint the stage, I mean, it, tradition, I guess a traditional service now would be your desktop support, virtualization, hardware, um, but uh, increasingly starting to see um, new entrance into into the space where um, the differentiator is not how they can deliver better desktop support. They're offering something else. Um, in some cases, it can be, hey, we're a small nano-sized MSP. We're doing some business consultation, and we just happen to need to pick up um, uh, pick up desktop support on the side. In other cases, it's large organizations who have figured out that there's an interesting play for them. Like for example, I don't think many people know, but Rico, the the printer manufacturer is actually a sizable MSP. Like they're actually, they're going out there selling printer services first, but then there's desktop support tacked on the back of that. And there's a regular seven or eight figure, I think eight figure sum attached to that business too, that they regularly report on too. And I think this is where it gets really kind of interesting because, um, you know, whether it's business consultancy automation, maybe it's DevOps or a software consult, uh, it's not, um, unheard of now to talk to an MSP and they say, oh yeah, we happen to have like a software development group in the MSP or we've got a DevOps group or we happen to do like X, Y, Z. And this one, um, I kind of feel like is a little bit misunderstood like for the opportunity it potentially is. A lot of the struggle in, in going and delivering um, new services has been the time and expertise and the tooling and you know, the upfront investment to go build a new division to go chase these things. But there's new tools coming down the pipe. Like for example, Power Automate. You've got access to it in M365, I believe. Um, and it's one of those tools that being a low code, uh, not no code, but low code, um, you can actually start automating things, not just in-house, but I've actually started to see business practices being spun up like, okay, we'll, we'll not just consult and see what's going on with the technology side of the house, but we can actually start to give you an unfair advantage across your competition, you know, Mr. Client, by automating a lot of your business process. And so um, these could potentially open up like an interesting new wave of services 
that haven't just not been considered because like oh that's not a standard that's not for a standard msp or like that's just not a regular service yeah, that's, that's generally dev or devops or something that we don't offer as a company yeah but but it's 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 rising more um there's uh like a, a good example of where the thinking's a little bit skewed is there's a um aws tried to coin, coin the term of a hypercloud msp uh, a few years back the idea was, as an MSP that said, we're going to rethink our stack entirely. We're not going to do any infrastructure or virtualization because you should use AWS. Of course, AWS inventing the term. And the the primary services that these MSPs were offering was actually um, high-level technology consult. We'll come and actually do architecture. We'll also happen to do all the regular things that a normal MSP would do. And some of these are interesting and very successful. But... Um, Obviously, that works if you're at a certain scale or you've brought in some of that existing expertise. Um, I think what's probably going to be more interesting is the stuff is a little bit more accessible to even like a one-man band, which is um, power scary. automate. Sorry? It's scary. <laughs> it is a little scary. Like you look at things like UiPath um, and how quickly that stuff can just quickly eliminate um, a whole bunch of common tasks and get them done really, really quickly. But being able to like add that as an additional um, item to your services is uh, could be actually quite lucrative. I I would concur with that. I mean, because you hear those stories all the time on like Reddit or Imgur or wherever you decide to digest your fun stuff. Is like I went in and uh, I had a I had a client who I you know, their secretary was spending four hours building this Excel spreadsheet. I wrote a macro in, macro in ten minutes, and now that secretary's out of job. <laughs> And, you know, it's just like, that's, that's happening on a much bigger scale now. And it's much easier. You don't have to know how to write a, a macro in Excel to do that or just use Excel. Uh, but I mean, but I mean, for example, um, in my company, we built a proof of concept fax service in power flow, power automate flow, um, with, with low code, like it, it, it looks hideous from the flow standpoint, but it works but it's i i think now's a time where it, it was it was hard to sort of justify why we jump into this or even potentially think about this as a service where uh say two three years ago pre-pandemic but now with um with hiring being one of the hardest things to do uh i think it actually becomes a little bit more worthwhile it's kind of funny the reason why you want like a ui path exists in the first place and then power automate sort of followed along is because um the company was losing to uh, outsourcing companies they could afford to throw like five or ten cheaper resources at a problem and our compete so the idea was i want to have i've got a couple of key people i want them to be able to win a contract or win a job but i want them to do smarter higher value things so ui path was born and here's this monstrous robotic automation engine I think the same thing is, is kind of similar here. But like the goal is not to walk into a client and say, I can replace your staff. Like, no, that, yeah. that's not yeah. great. That's really negative. Don't yep. do that. Nope. Horrible. But you imagine the me problem, say, and the yeah. outcome was that they no longer need that staff. But that's you didn't present it that way. You should be fine. <laughs> no, no, no. And, and, and instead, instead, the way it does come across is, is, hey, you've got one person there doing like four different jobs because they can't hire a team of like six or eight to support mm -hmm. them what if two thirds of those jobs is just manual labor, which is like, pick up this PDF, read a field here, put it into a form over there. Why can't that be automated so they can go spend more time with their clients or more time making important decisions where they, they should be like free up their, their mental load, free up their day load and um, give themselves an advantage. Like the amount of manual paperwork that still gets done in the United States is rather scary. And so, I mean, it's downright insulting. <laughs> I mean, there's some yeah. industries that's a little bit harder to get out of, like, say, insurance, I suppose, or government. But those should be the easy ones. Everything's all digital now. Digital contracts, digital policy procedures. Come on. Get ah, ready. legislation. You've got to change the legislation first. We, I mean, <laughs> the Constitution was written on paper. We're beyond that now. Just get a Sharpie and a whiteboard. We'll erase it later. Someone's going to probably amend it at some point, so... Probably, probably. But until then, you know, we've still got uh, paper e-fax and the, the fact that e-fax exists actually scares me. <laughs> but mean, uh, still do like faxing and cause my wife's a nurse and faxing is still predominantly in the healthcare sector. Now that is scary. 
just a little bit, but um, maybe it'll change one day. One day. I mean, healthcare eventually got into public cloud. Maybe maybe eFax dying and fax dying entirely will be the next step forward. <laughs> Give it time. I would put money on it being around when we're driving space cars and heading to <laughs> Mars. Did you fax me that sheet yet? It, then it just prints that on their car. That's what I'm waiting to happen because it, it'll never die. It's the it's one of the technologies that'll never die. That's it. We're in the Jetsons era. Okay. Exactly. But it it it's it, it's one of those things where you can look at, you can look tech. The, the, the way that you can you can choose to look at this is this is tech that was normally only available to enterprise size companies, mm -hmm. and UiPath and more importantly Power Automate and then Zapier which effectively is if this, then that made super easy and accessible for business. Um, that that's now within your grasp for a very cheap price and be able to look and say, okay, let me go automate a bunch of things. Um, Power Automate combined with Teams means like I can help you reorganize your business, make you three times faster. That kind of ability to do that and say, oh, and then by the way, I'll keep all your desktops secure clean, consistent, always up and running, and it'll help you optimize your bill with Microsoft. Like, hang on, that's now a package. That's a package deal. You just walk in, you're a little bit more sticky because you're not just giving them the tech, you're actually involved in their business process. And as their business grows, hey, we need you to come back and tweak the business process. Like you can, you can see some interesting potential parallels there, but it's gonna take a different dimension of thinking because it's now people consultation, it's less tech. Uh, I, yes, Ray, you will have to pass proof of your insurance <laughs> <from> your space <laughs> car. <laughs> um, <laughs> what, so that, what, what you just said is scary to normal MSP businesses. What you, you just instilled fear into anyone who heard that, who happens to be in a high level at an MSP. Most techs who listen to that are like, cool, that sounds awesome. Um, but you basically... So how do, how do I, in your perspective, take advantage of this? Do I spin up a, a, a no code as a service, low code as a service? Start internally, to be honest. I, I, I think the, I think it's just like any other sort of technology adoption. And the same way when Intune came out with autopilot, like, hey, let me test it out of my own gear. Or, you know, you go and buy an RMM. Like, I want to go break it in my environment before it let this anywhere near my clients. If you're building a service, you want to know that it works so you can then construct your value proposition, how I'm going to sell this to the client, how I'm going to think about the pitch. Um, you, you start with the basics. You start to automate some of your internal things. Sometimes it's simple. It might be, um, hey, right now you're accepting leads it's just a, a shared mailbox, an M365. Well, hang on, why not just automate and make sure that's coming into a Teams channel? Like, why does it need to be stuck in email? Maybe you can go notify two or three key important people to go pick this up. Or even integrate Maybe. into an opportunity in your PSA. Yeah, and you, yeah. And you start with some of the basic things. You look at ways of like, hey, does it take somebody more than a few clicks to do this? Is this something I do more than two, three times? Um, and you start looking at some of those angles. Now, Admittedly, they're your problems. They're not your client's problems. But I think it gives you a confidence level. Like with anything else we do with tech, you want to be confident with it so you can walk in and say, hey, you know, you can go talk to your client, like, hey, I want to try something different. Would you be open to, let's just do a quick experiment here and see what happens? Yeah, and you could theoretically charge because you, you, at some point, you're still managing the inputs, right? You're still making sure they're running, and if they're not, you're you're double checking. You have manpower with that. You can still continue your managed services with that, and you do have the option of adding in dev re dev work or having that separate. Because technically, it's development resources. Because you can you can find a job doing low code jobs or no code jobs. Like hmm. that is that is a legit like you know area that you can work in and be an expert in that you'd never have to code a day in your life, but you're effectively coding. So, I mean, it's, it's a, it's an interesting perspective to, to, to have to add that in there. But I, I do think it will be more towards those types of, uh, eventually move towards those types of setups where you set up into, you build the client the way it needs to be built. You deploy their software packages that they need. You make sure they're, applications work you set up double browsers just in case they can't access one or whatever you know 
and then you start automating their business, their actual business, then not just software and systems and security. You just automate their actual business, which oh, if you think about it, it's kind of scary in a way. <laughs> I mean, the whole point is meant to be that you you automate yourself out of the current job so you can go solve the next job and 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 keep moving forward instead of doing the same thing over and over. So in a way, it can be with the right mindset around it and I think also the right lens as to what are the right problems to solve, or at least just, if you're not sure, at least having a good way to experiment and learn quickly because your regions may be different, may be different. your clients may be different, what they do may be different to the next, the next MSP and the next MSP. So... You'd be able to, if there was a one size fits all tool, Microsoft would have already built it. And they didn't. They built your platform to go build things on top Not of it. Yet. I think even then they would still struggle because it's still a heavy touch problem because you're dealing with every individual business, you're dealing with how they want to do things, or even if you have a standardized method, because say you do nothing but say dental practices or warehouses or something, you know, that's not something that's in the aggregate large enough for Microsoft to go tackle and justify investment in. Yeah. But they can, they can, they, what they can do. And I think this is where it gets interesting is they can justify investment and saying, Hey, we can give you more canned tools out of the box. Like you look at power automate back when it was, I think it was Microsoft flow. Wasn't it back in the day? Yeah. Flow. That's why I call it power flow because I confused the two. (laughs) You look at like a lot of the V1 things, you could do some interesting things, but it was still a little bit crippled. In, in sort of a certain way. Mm-hmm. And then a lot of the V2 actions came out and you could really, really automate um, just common process like uh, kickoffs with your service desk and on a Monday morning just to see how everybody's sort of going through to making sure you're collecting feedback. I'm about to onboard uh, a prospect. Can I make sure that the right things go out or the right tickets get created? Or, you know, things where systems don't normally talk to each other. I mean, it's come a long way because they keep releasing new canned Lego blocks for you to play with and to plug in. I think as those Lego blocks continue to come down the pipe, as new services come out from Azure or from other vendors, like that just gives you the next level. Oh, here's a business problem I'd like to go off and solve. Yeah. And honestly, at the end of the day, regardless of how great your automation and your, your coding skills are, it's going to break <laughs> and someone's going to have to troubleshoot that. So, you know, that's if, 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 you're not managing your your client's automation like that and, and there is a way to you'll, you'll have to fix something that's not working properly or it becomes a kelvin service it, yeah or it becomes a <laughs> kelvin service it, or it's probably just dns shelf. related it's always dns <laughs> until it's not dns um sure but uh let's let's talk about vendor management Let, let's let's move this into because technically you are a vendor I am a vendor. Um, um, this is this is an interesting topic um, for me, uh, not because of that I work for a vendor, but I guess because um, I guess I see some sort of the relationships that that sort of occur out there. Um, there's an interesting difference when I talk to um, MSPs that you know are pulling say five, six, seven figures versus the ones that are pulling say. Um, eight or nine there's a very <laughs> boo vendors thanks Ray. <laughs> <laughs> says the vendor <laughs> <laughs> i keep forgetting that yeah <laughs> he's technically also a vendor <laughs> <laughs> are you booing yourself we're not quite sure cyclical it'll come back yeah it's it, it's interesting because msps spend you spend a lot of time vetting out Like I need an RMM, I need a PSA, or I need like a piece of storage. And so a lot of work goes into doing the initial work. And then the relationship sort of just stops. It's like, okay, I'm paying the bill. I've got a feature, I've got a bug that needs to, (laughs) there you go. I've got a feature, a bug that needs to to be solved, but like there's no additional sort of work done beyond that. And something that I find interesting that occurs a little bit more upstream is, um, when you look back at like what we were just talked about with non-traditional services, or like looking at different ways to, you know, show me what you've done for me lately. Oh, we can we can definitely show you that exquisite detail. Some of these larger vendors are starting to sorry, these MSPs are starting to ask these vendors um, different questions. They're no longer walking in and saying, "Hey, 
we're interested in feature X, Y, Z. Or, you know, when are you going to give me this specific feature? I mean, they still sometimes ask, but it's more, we want to know what problems you're solving in the next two, three years, because we ourselves want to go off and solve this in our space. We want to know what can help us assemble that solution or assemble that service or solution service together very quickly or do we need to go do something ourselves and say a power automate or perhaps just hire a couple of developers for a short period of time before we then say okay time to go to v2 of the service now we'll plug in with this existing sort of platform over here and so you know seeing the relationship is not just a way to manage like what you have today and the existing clientele that use that but leveraging the relationship with the vendor to like inform and figure out your own vision strategy is very undercapitalized and it's a little it seems like a little under uh misunderstood in some ways i i can see that um i have interacted with a number of vendors in the community and elsewhere um from a, several different perspectives from as an admin of msp geek to as a potential user of their service and I find the smaller vendors, the ones that are, you know, I guess it's generally, it's, they're more agile, um, are much more open to our needs as a business and our potential problem solvers than some of the bigger vendors. I'm not saying they don't listen, right? Because they obviously are listening. Now, I, it may not have as much weight is being one of a million versus one of a thousand um but it's it's it i have had those really good conversations to say look uh you release this tool it's great but unfortunately none of it's automated i have x number of things i've got to go do there's no way i can sit and do this um there's no way i can sit and adjust these manually um and, and make sure that it, because the tool looks great, looks fantastic. I'd love to use it, but I can't because I don't have time. Um, and they, you know, the feedback was taken back. It was, uh, you know, listened. It was like, you know, we understand that this is our initial setup. This is where we need to start from so that we can gather metrics. And I was like, yeah, that makes sense. I completely understand. I may use it for one or two to verify and help give you some more information back. Like it became a dialogue of how to better solve the problem they're trying to solve and to help me solve my problems, then here's here's this thing, this is how it is, peace. Yeah, and and because it's it's I think also too, like the larger the larger sort of the company, the more incumbent upon um uh, technology vendor or a uh, an MSP or an SI or even the even to be frankly honest, even the GSIs out there. Um the it's, it's kind of very underrated and also um very time expensive you have to build like a, a lot of interesting relationships to sort of figure out where uh, a particular vendor may or may not be going in order to then be able to develop a better sense for is this given product portfolio product going to solve these problems for me but it's the kind of thing that can sort of help in a huge way like if you're aligned with say netapp and nimble over at HPE, you definitely want to make sure you're friends with, say, the product, the program manager, probably one of their top um, super SEs, so that you can figure out, okay, there's interesting things that I think will affect my roadmap for my own services and say, year two, three, four from now. Um, but at the same time, too, like I saw Ray's point, and it's a very important point he's made, which is some of the vendors won't share meaningful data that's necessary to sort of do that planning. I think that's where that's where it's completely fair to just push back and say, hey, I'm actually trying to plan my services this far out. This is why I'm asking. I'm not asking you because I want feature shiny feature X. It's like, I need to plan out the next evolution of the services coming forward. Like, give me more detail, give me more insight and, and, and just force that evolution in the space. Because I, I get it both from my side working vendor, but also having worked uh, briefly at an MSP, you've got to have two minds about how you solve these things. One is, how do I solve the immediate problem now? I've got a client or a proposal I want to land or an existing client that needs to fix this problem and you figure out how to cobble something together on what I have right now, assemble a solution and then ship it and then maintain it versus something that I can then get off the shelf a little bit later and then I can reclaim all the technical debt spent 
on maintaining the existing solution and go reclaim it on the next thing. You're kind of like constantly leapfrogging forward your your own um, your own work to get to the, like the next the next valuable thing. Yeah. Um, so from from a vendor perspective, how do we? How would I? Uh, how would it best if I were to approach a vendor? And it could be Dado, it could be Ninja, it could be Connectwise. Probably know. What's the best route for me to take to try to help me plan my business with the new feature segment? How would I? How would you feel would be best approached if I was to come to you with that ultimate goal in mind? What do you think would be most effective? I should say. I'll tell you a, a, a little not so known secret from I guess not just in the MSP space, but like pretty much any product manager anywhere on the planet. They always fear that they never get enough time with. Uh, with MSPs, with partners, with clients. So just saying, hey, I want to have a very specific conversation because I want to have a very specific conversation about like where things are going, whether it's from like technology, technology perspective, product roadmap perspective, because I'm trying to plan these services out. Here's what I offer today. I'm thinking about where are you guys going? What outcomes? Don't care about your features. I care about what problems you're going to solve because I want to see, can I monetize this? Can I wrap a service around this? Can I relabel this as my own product? to go out there and push. Um, <laughs> hey, Ray, what's your roadmap? <laughs> <laughs> vendors do love it when you bash them publicly and then immediately demand things after bashing uh, whoever happens to be the face of the company at that particular time. Uh, well, it's not, super... necessarily, not necessarily bashing. It's, it's kind of interesting because you're seeing... Well, there, 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 there is <laughs> times when they bash, let's be honest. Um, there, True. <laughs> there, there are times, because sometimes... It, it it depends because it's it's very very like if it if it's a text communication it's very difficult to understand tone tonality and the proper conveyance of meaning, so it looks very blunt and especially if you're a technical person you don't fluff, you just blatantly state the issue, and that can come across as uh, very unpolitical. Um, so while sometimes they are not bashing, sometimes. They're just trying to communicate ineffectively to what their issue is. Um, but sometimes they just need to be called out on it. I will say that. Um, if, if a vendor makes a bad decision that's hurtful to their user base. Call it out. I, respectfully it's, yeah. call it out. Yeah. Um, and it's important that I think you can do that until it, they either make a change or they acknowledge that they purposely did it. One of the two. And then if they I, acknowledge I, it, you just you pay for a new vendor. <laughs> I, um, yeah, speaking of like historical stuff, I've, I've not been a data long enough to see like particular history, but I remember when with uh, VMware uh, was rethinking, from what I can re remember from the time, they were rethinking pricing and packaging around um, ESX. So there's around the time around the 5, 5.x era, maybe 4.x. And they started to shift towards um, pricing against VRAM because they were trying to um, encourage people to build more smaller machines. Like, don't have one super scaled up virtual machine. Try to have tens or twenties or thirties of them. Problem is that doesn't necessarily. It didn't reflect the reality of the application footprints that existed out there in their customer base. Yeah, so they had a massive like riot. You're yeah. charging me a huge amount for VRAM, like. Please recall that decision. <laughs> yeah, that and sounds they like a horrible business because they just didn't understand the market. I, I, I can understand what they were trying to do because um, not more than maybe they one or two later. They microservices before microservices were microservices. They tried to build public cloud. They tried to do AWS, but it took AWS to come in and explain it in a way that everyone went, everyone went okay, now I understand what you're trying to do. And I think they were trying to appeal to the wrong people being where we're trying to appeal to system administrators. AWS said, no, you need to appeal to the developers. And now here we are where it's more common to deploy 30, 40, 50 virtual machines instead of one monstrous 192 gig virtual machine. So yeah, it, it can be get a little, a little bit interesting like that. But the, the main point is that they, the, the feedback was respectable and consistent. And so they did react. So like that, that's kind of dialogues and conversation can happen. Yeah, um, and it's also important to be represented, represent, represented, represented in those areas where you can benefit. Like, 
you're a product manager. You're in the MSP Geek community. Shout out to us. Boop, boop. Um, and if someone came to you and said, hey, I use your product. I'm trying to do this. While you may not be the exact resource for that to end up at, you could potentially put in place uh, a conversation to accelerate your roadmap better than what it could be because you had that one conversation with that one individual. Yes, absolutely. Like you, you, there's the only way that it's like, if you're having a difficult time with a client and you're not understanding like why they're not, you are just put in F365 and it's not perhaps going the way they, they, they want. You don't sit there and stare at a bunch of metrics and worry about it. You pick up the phone or you, know, you jump in a zoom call and you say, Hey, just want to understand more. I want to listen. I want to understand. And, you know, it's, it's a relationship. It's a relationship that has to be maintained, but it's also, it, it is a two-way relationship too. And so, um, <laughs> I'm going to ignore Ray in the chat for a second. Yeah. <laughs> we'll move on. Uh, um, and I, th I think it's, it, it, it definitely says a lot to be said that um, understanding what you not just get out of your relationship, but who you're liaising with makes a huge yeah. difference. Like knowing that, you know, any, any vendor that's probably selling SaaS services, they always have, there's an account manager, there's a customer success team, there's support teams, there's problem management teams, like go managers. make... Yeah, yeah, like like go make uh, go make friends with a few of those. Ask for introductions or like understand how to um, liaise with you know you know what your primary contact is, but you also have some other people that you can source information from because that like, the larger the organization, particularly when you get to say you know NetApps, Microsofts of the world, like it helps to understand. You know, they're a big organization for a good very good reason. Sometimes that can help you. Like you don't just have your Microsoft account manager; you've got you know, who's looking after partners sort of in the region, who's looking, you know, program managers or community managers to help you with like new things that happen in Power Automate. Like relationships can go a very long way. It works, you know, well for MSPs, you know, talking with their clients and understanding their clients and also talking with other MSPs in the region. The vendor side is also just as equally important. Yeah, it's a, uh, I enjoy having discussions. It's, 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 yeah. you get different perspectives. You get to learn much more than you would if you didn't have that discussion. Um, and you're, you're relatively new to the MSP geek world. Um, I'm not saying you're here yesterday, but considering how long we've been around and, and our influence with that as a area, um, what have you had any of those discussions brought on at MSP geek? Has anyone approached you and said, Hey, I'm looking to have this discussion. Uh, yet. Cause after this, not yet, they may, <laughs> No, because I, I, I think also too, um, I mean, I've, I've originally come from an enterprise world mm -hmm. where, and I think it's where the enterprise MSPs out there, um, they know and understand they live and breathe it. Like they have dedicated people who do nothing but manage their vendors and facilitate this for the different divisions across MSPs. And so you almost took it for granted working in say enterprise vendor space or an enterprise MSP that this thing was accessible and available to begin with. Like, hey, I need to get this technology solved. Who are our contacts? Well, cool. I've got the CTO, I've got a program manager, and two team leads that you probably want to have a conversation with each other within the next week. Jump on the call. And so when um, I jump to MSP Geek or you know uh, some of the experience I've seen at some of the other vendors, that relationship, uh, it's not that it's not uh, accessible, but it's not known that you can actually just pick up and start that conversation. Or you may get a no, but at least they'll say, hey, but you should probably have a conversation over here with this person instead. Yeah, because you also want to target the correct person. If there's a support issue, talking to a product manager isn't going to do anything. <laughs> like, and, and you I might be able to too. move that into the, the, the proper communication channels, but it's not going like you're not going to be able to solve their problem, right? But if they yeah. were looking at an into an integration, like you or a Veeam integration or whatever, like that would be a conversation you could either facilitate or help find the right product manager to have that conversation with but yeah it's, it's important uh, i think it's also i think it's also been a little bit difficult because like a lot of the, the first initial sort of SaaS applications there's nobody to contact so the expectation never took hold particularly in the, in the current generation of, of sort of engineers there's an expectation that you can't contact anybody at the other end but that's that couldn't be further from the truth there's always somebody you can figure out how to call and 
If you don't, that's the time to start mapping out your, your relationships and actually start figuring out where do I have my connections? Who do I need to talk to? Do I talk to them regularly? Do I have meaningful conversations, not about like the state of my account or the, you know, the next license, but like, hey, this is where my business is going. You should probably know because this is helpful. Yeah, and not that I'm advocating completely DMing him with all of your suggestions uh, at all. Please don't do that. Um, it I, I've noticed recently with the uptake of, of new smaller vendors that they're they're hungry for those ideas and those problems to be able to solve for you and it's harder to see that with bigger organizations because you're you're cloud you're hidden you're hidden behind a row of support people and a row of account managers and a row of you know executives who are like yeah we have these great product managers and why don't you schedule a meeting with a vendor or with a partner? And you're like, what partner do I meet with? And is that partner going to give me the data I need? And it's, it's a, it's an interesting perspective to have somewhere like MSP geek to where you could possibly have those conversations. Cause I know a few have taken place with other vendors. Um, and yeah, it can I mean, be they're, they're, they're craving thing. it just as much. It's like, um, you know, occasionally you see somebody, you say, ask, I'll just pick on Kelvin because I can, yeah. um, they'll ask Kelvin, Kelvin, like ha- Kevin, yeah. Kevin, <laughs> we're killing him Kevin now, are we? Yeah. Um, but they'll they'll ask, like, how do you come up with these ideas for these scripts you're writing or that blog you're going to do? And it's like, because he's listening to what his clients are having problems with and that thing gives him the inspiration to go at the problem. There's a conversation that's been had there, whether directly or indirectly. Um, go have those conversations, go start those conversations, both with your vendors, but also internally too. Yeah, just yeah. knowing that those problems, like they give you ideas for, is there a new service we need to eat and go off and investigate? Is there automation we should do? Should we, you know, interesting tech that's coming from Microsoft that we should exploit or, you know, from data or anybody else? Like it's, it's, yeah, conversations are uh, a currency for sure. Yeah. And it, it's, it's almost critical at this point. Like we're in a major juncture in the MSP space and we're rapidly evolving into this new MSP and, Now's the time to be having these conversations with any vendor that you can have that conversation with. And if they're willing to listen and willing to help you solve your problems, that's a good vendor. If they're just going to put you in a support ticket and just let you sit in the back burner for weeks, you may want to evaluate who your contacts are at that vendor or just the vendor themselves. No, absolutely. Absolutely. believe i believe that's it right we don't have any more topics i mean we talk about anything like we got on night <laughs> we, we certainly can the chat's been a little bit quiet today um it's uh it, it's it's been an interesting week because we had at it nation last week um we had a vendor spotlight on monday i did a my company podcast yesterday and it's it's a uh, it's it's a very slow week thanksgiving is next week you got that reinvent too. and ignite coming up yep it is going to be a little bit busy. Just a little bit. Like, I don't, my calendar is just like, yeah, I'm just like, I don't, I don't know where I find the time to have all these fun conversations. Why well, you don't wait for the Cortana email to come out and tell you how much of your life you're spending in a meeting? <laughs> uh, well, it's not Cortana anymore. It's Adam or something. If they change the name. It'll take a while to erase that name from my mind. <laughs> yeah. Also Halo release. So there's that. That is true. That is true. I forget what they named it, but I haven't gotten an email telling me. Uh, uh, Viva? Eva? Is it Eva? Uh, V-I-V-A? I, I sometimes have fun pronouncing things, so. They must have saw that I just ignored them and didn't feed them because I don't see one recently. I've been in a lot more meetings in the past two weeks than I have in a while. Should be getting emailed. Fake Cortana. Um, so I guess we're in the Q and A stage. Um, any cues that we can a? Oh, people are thinking about it too. It's it's getting kind of interesting with the uh, the hiring problems that are sort of existing out there. It, it feels like we're starting to see a shift in the talent pool problem. I mean, there's still it's still hard to hire people, but it's, it's starting to hear a, a, a sense of. Um, I mean, you you've got large companies that are throwing out serious total compensation packages, 
to try and secure people, but the, the quality of life and the work-life balance or perhaps just being penalised when you pay because you're in a certain tier city, um, sort of causing a, lot, a, a little bit of an exodus of some talent to say, like, hey, I want to go work on something more meaningful. And it feels like there could be a slight change in the winds, like for MSPs to say, hey, we actually do solve interesting problems. You'll always be working on something different every day. Um, but doing something in a healthy way you actually could help re uh, capture some of that talent. Um, because it, like everyone's hiring or difficulty hiring, uh, you know, specific individuals that meet their needs and being able to quote unquote spin up this business with this exodus of development genius um, who are just tired of grinding against AWS and react scripts. They, uh, you know, it could be something interesting that they learn on. It might lead to a lot of unconventional hires happening too. Like, hey, we're more willing to train you up and work in a certain space. And you don't have to, you know, move to Seattle. You don't have to move to San Fran. Yeah, but I mean, but it's like the hiring space for development has has basically been full stack or no stack, at, you know, in, in the recent sections, right? You can either code at all or you can't work here. <laughs> And, and it's, I think that's starting to change because people, that, that's a lot. I mean, that's a lot of technologies to shove in your brain. And it to, is it, to it's, be it's continue, to be consistent with what you need to code, you know, jumping. I mean, it's, it seems like it's cool on paper that you can edit a UI and then boom, go in and write the back end to, to manipulate the APIs and then boom, go back into the front end and, and consume those APIs. But that's. You know the entire product, but your code is just worse than it could be if you just focused on one of those things. Yeah, it's not, it's also just not the software engineering too. Like it's seeing some shifts in terms of like network engineers, cybersecurity. Like cybersecurity is one of the hardest places. Even just getting like SOC level one analysts can be well, difficult for cybersecurity is software. such a wild west. Like anyone can be a security analyst, right? And make a lot of money, but not really do anything <laughs> or know anything. <laughs> I, it's, there's still a high, there's a high barrier of, of skills they have to learn first, which yeah, you basically have to be a mini sysadmin to, to sort of get there. But um, I think just even just regular um, like sysadmin engineering sort of styles are. I'm not going to be surprised. I won't be surprised if it sort of gets to a point where um, a lot of MSPs and even regular companies are like, hey, we're willing to sort of like train up uh, a little bit more, like tap into other other previous pools to sort of get people on as opposed to we need to have a ready to go level three engineer. Well, there are no ready to go level three engineers unless you're willing to compete on, on cost. So time to start thinking about cultivating these people because they're not going to appear. They're not going to suddenly mag uh, magically appear. You're going to have to cultivate the talent. True. And while I, on the surface, agree with you, Ray, someone has to write the ability to be able to low code, no code. <laughs> You need, you need someone smart enough to be able to be like, all right, let's take this block and make it editable. Um, Power Automate doesn't write itself. That's right. Uh, it doesn't improve itself either. But seriously, if, if somebody hasn't seriously uh, played with Power Automate, they, I, I think if anything else, like if you're sitting there at Thanksgiving and you're, you're, you're uh, perhaps the conversation at Thanksgiving is uh, making you reach for your Thanksgiving bingo card, yeah. <laughs> whip out your laptop I'm and full. fire and a port at Power Automate and have some fun. Yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, that, that, those are the type of things you remember back when I was, you know, coming up in the IT world, you know, I could get my hands on a server and I could install ESX5 and start playing around with virtual machines and setting up VM, you know, VMs and then getting them to talk to each other via the networking, which was just horrible. And then, you know, doing all this kind of cool stuff. And then that's kind of phased out because no one uses servers anymore. Like that's not a, that's not an up and coming technology or a, a firm. I mean, people still use them, don't get me wrong, but like. It's, it's not dead yet, but it's more like you're going to encounter this in an enterprise or a large mid market. You're right. Yeah. But and it, being able like, to just play with cool stuff. And that's, that's now power automate and Intune. And... I mean, if you wind back the clock three years ago, one of the, the biggest topics you see on Reddit slash RMSP was I want to do PowerShell, but I don't have time. Or like, I want to write some PowerShell, but I don't know what I want to go off and solve. Like, how is perhaps looking at the way that you automate parts of your business or you automate some of the common functions that you, when you log in as an L3 engineer, like, why would they not be considered in the same realm? Like, you do have to start somewhere. You do have to take the initiative. But 
the tools are now at the same level. Like with PowerShell, where where it's come and how far it's come, you don't have to write a C++ program from scratch anymore. You just get in there, load your commandlet, and you start manipulating Azure AD, Exchange Online, anything you want to. Um, it, it, Power Automate's starting to get on that same that same grasp too. It's just getting in there and just starting the first step. I think is where um, I think it may be a little bit of a struggle for most because I, I get it. Like time is a big problem, but I think it's a, a, one of those investments that's well worth the time. I'm gonna get cancelled for saying this, but PowerShell from a language perspective is just god awful. <laughs> Whoever pros, decides pros and cons. Th- it is nothing but con. Like slash gt you hated dash, hell, did you? Dash, dash gt for greater than like you're killing me like it reminds me of pearl which sounded powerful but then nobody likes regular expressions anyway so <laughs> exactly that's why pearl's dead <laughs> and powershell only is popular because it's powershell on windows <laughs> because it is a powerful application you know it, it's a it, it's bash times two like it you know the ability to write c sharp implementations immediately and be able to do you know write a commandlet almost immediately is fantastic but whoever decided to sculpt the language the way they did should not write any more languages please you're more than welcome to start your own language uh file code done it just takes powershell and converts it to real programming language <laughs> that's all it does <laughs> you you write a file and it just converts it to powershell PowerShell 2, the the good PowerShell, where nothing really works. That sounds like a bleeding edge of like Python or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's a Python compiler that runs. You just type it and it just compiles it from Python compiler. No, it's it's Go. Excuse me, Go is the new hotness. You gotta you gotta put it. It's gotta be in Go. It is a lot more accessible these days. Um, I think it's one can, of those areas with, like, if you the, find Scott, you can ask him about Golang. He's super interested to talk to you about it. <laughs> I know enough to be dangerous in Golang, but I'm not going to touch it. <laughs> Even as a PM, I still occasionally touch code because um, you know, I'm interested in, in in API, still interested in what can be done in those sort of areas. But yeah, Golang is is like something I'll reserve for like, I mean, over Christmas time, perhaps. Golang. Both intrigue me and perplexes me with how it does things. Like it's it's scary some of the things that you can do with GoLang, but like it's like not cool. But that is like from a security perspective, a nightmare. I think this is also going to be another interesting sort of turn of events too. Like you look at um, you've got some MSPs out there that are experimenting different ways. You know, couple with PowerShell, obviously, it's got with GoLang, but also too. Um, uh, different players who have found that they can, you know, they're really, really good at it's like writing Azure functions or writing other, other bits and pieces or writing internal tools for their MSP. It, it kind of feels like um, uh, sometimes every once in a while, like like you get to like a six, you know, halfway through the year or towards the end of the year, a little bit of introspection on what you do as an MSP and what you do really well and taking a close look at that and understanding whether that's something that you should do for your clients we capitalize on that think about that a little bit differently um because yeah, that's how kelvin got to um you know dealing with the ctf like i could see the, the value of uh, you look back to the cyber drain ctf the value that, that brings from a training perspective to just regularly continually reinforce skills with the engineers and make it fun like that kind of thing um is a superpower of his if he doesn't turn that into a service, I'm going to be very disappointed. <laughs> um, I will be not disappointed. But we can do an MSP Geek Street here. You start it. Don't give him ideas. Uh, <laughs> shout out to Kelvin and CyberDrain and their newest product, SIP, C-I-P-P, which is basically a glorified Microsoft multi-tenant management interface. What partner portal should have been? Yes, if I use the words right? Should have been. Um, so if you haven't checked that out, uh, there's a Discord somewhere. Just Google it if you find it. It's it's all over the internet. It's a GitHub. It's just that it's great. It's fantastic. You should use it. Um, so shout out to him, Kelvin, uh, Gavin Stone, a ton of other people who I'm not mentioning. 
no, Discord is closed for me, so I'm not going to open it and look at all the people and read their names off, although I would. Um, but a ton of people have contributed to it. It's a great platform. It's what uh, it's what vendors should do for their new applications for the upcoming massive changes to everyone going to Intune and whatnot. Yeah, it's it's. I I definitely can agree with that. I mean, there's, there's... Sip confirmed. Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm, kidding. I'm kidding. I it's like joke. my job. I'm not getting <laughs> shot anytime this week. Thank joke. you very much. <laughs> that is a joke. Uh, it's unconfirmed. Um, not a sound thing. I, I, the way it's set up, you wouldn't be able to do anything with it, even if you did buy it. No, I, I think it. I think it's a good example of. Um, you have an immediate problem that needs to be solved right now. Mm -hmm. Like you can't wait. It's, this is causing so much significant it's pain set up to, to solve my problem, not set up to solve everyone's problem. Yes. Which I think from a business perspective, you need to solve everyone's problem from an open source perspective, which it is it's uh, solve my problem. It's also always going to be a question of investment too. Like, um, I, I do like how Kelvin's been very pragmatic about, um, what can go off and solve, particularly with like mm -hmm. core contributors versus um, irregulars contributing towards the towards the repo. Um, uh, it's it's definitely I think it's solved like that initial goal and it's done it very well. Uh, hats off to the UI aspect as well. But I think it's also um, Kelvin it's spent like, days learning HTML and CSS, so. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's that's uh that's HTML CSS is one area I can't touch. <laughs> too true. Man, CSS confuses me. Like I understand it. I know what it's doing, but like writing SAS and SCSS to get it to compile, like that I don't know why, but it's just like this doesn't make any sense to my brain. It's a dark art. It is hundred percent a dark UI in general is a dark art, and there's very few people who are good at it. Yeah, this, this, this is why there's like dedicated positions just for dealing with with uh, with front end UI and their entire life is CSS and maybe some React. Exactly. <laughs> I can definitely understand that part. I'm not going to mention a certain computer UI screen who I constantly bring up anytime UI and UX comes up um, for a specific product that I may or may not use. I, it takes it takes time. Like even <laughs> it's been <laughs> years. <laughs> been years and they still haven't changed it to be a modicum of understanding okay moving on from the computer ui screen that i've mentioned <laughs> maybe it'll get fixed one day like it'll be like 2087 and i'm like all right we're deprecating the app and i'm like just, just one change for me please i'm retired now it doesn't matter just change it that'll be the day i will uh that'll be the single pane of glass that is the one of the, the that's the future though single pane of glass been hearing single pane of glass for 20 years it is it's and but no one's done context. it correctly i no think single is... pane of context is the most accurate way to describe it i mean even as i look at microsoft with with five different portals at the same time too like when i log into my exchange you know, in, in, in say security center or going to compliance or i go into even the, the regular admin i'm in the context of solving that set of problems that specific configuration like i think I think we've all translated a single pane of glass to single pane of context. Because yeah, um, it's being able to access and do what I need to do from a single vantage point, and it's not, it doesn't mean I have to open up separate applications and log in seven different times and two FA four different times because the second time didn't work. I mean, you could argue the PowerShell is a single pane of glass if you really want to go that far. <laughs> Look, no, I'm not going back to PowerShell. I'm already canceled for that. I don't need to recancel <laughs> myself. Um. There's an app that I utilized and I couldn't log in one day. It just, it just wouldn't let me log in. Like I've logged in previously, saved creds, super secure, everything, you know, the legit way. It failed. It aired out. It unable to log in. It was an error message. Very bottom. Couldn't even see it, which bad UX design. But so I opened a ticket and I was like, hey, what? <laughs> it's just spinning and nothing is happening. It's just sitting there spinning like it's doing stuff. And then it, like, five minutes, it kills it. There's no information telling me it's asking me for 2FA. None. If I open the app, it says, hey, 
do you want a 2FA? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I do. No information is telling me I need to look at my app. There's no second pop that says enter your MFA code. And it's, it's perhaps the most infuriating thing ever because there's nothing I'm doing wrong. Everything is correct, but I don't have the information to process the next step. And it's actively refusing to give me the information. That can be a frustrating experience. <laughs> it is, because I had to open a ticket when I didn't need to. You could have just said, hey, check 2FA. <laughs> just a little pop-up. I mean, you're spinning. You obviously know what's happening. Just JavaScript. It's a callback. It's Ajax. Come on now. This is Web 2.0 stuff. Isn't the browser now a single pane of glass? I'm going to assume that was intentional. <laughs> um, uh, I would agree it's intentional. And yes, it is. As my seven different individual windows of my browser, not counting tabs, because I don't have all night, um, will attest. Uh, I, and I'm okay with that. Like it's a, it, if if my single website can get me to ten different websites that allow me to do the same thing, cool. I frame it all up. If you put me in an iframe inside of an iframe inside of an iframe. Whatever helps me get my job done quicker, faster, and more efficient, I'm all for it. And if you break something, allow me to troubleshoot effectively. And iframe will let me do that. Just FYI. Um, so it's you know, if if it is a single context the viewport, um then I'm fine with it. And I think that's where the market is headed. Finally, true single points of because the, 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 you're right, the Microsoft portal will take you to any other portal you want to go to. Yeah, but at least I, I, I think, well, um, as much as the browser still ranks king, I think we'll see more Macs and MSPs than we'll see Chromebooks at this particular rate, to be frankly honest. <laughs> uh, I refuse to use a Mac. Well, uh, um, I, don't know, I don't know if you saw uh, Stack Counter does some interesting statistics every once in a while. And think about partway through the pandemic kickoff, I guess, um, Mac OS, or at least Mac market share, was now 17 and a quarter percent global. That's a pretty large percentage comparing to where they've been. Yeah, sort of gradually growing over like a 15%. Like, don't get me wrong, like you, you chat to most other MSPs and they might say, hey, unless we're a completely 100% Mac shop, Macs maybe represent 2 or 3% of their fleet. But that many Macs being present. Yeah, you're going to have it's to learn concerns. how to manage a Mac eventually. Stop it. <laughs> I present you with more problems. Yeah, because they don't interface with any of the, the tool sets that business use. It, it complicates that a lot. Like, you can't AD a Mac. I mean, you can, but, like, really? Um, it, it, and just it, manage it with Intune. Management, oh, God. Uh, management of a Mac in general is just difficult. You have to be a part of the Microsoft biz or Apple business setup or mm -hmm. hire an MDM tool. <clears throat> and that's great for like a security perspective. Like what they're doing is cool. I, I like what they're doing to an extent, but the business world utilizes in its current format, Microsoft tool sets. And it's going to, it, it, by not interfacing with that, I think they're killing a lot of their younger market. But it, eventually, no one's going to use Microsoft Service much in enterprise anyway. So, see, that's going to be an interesting point because when you look at when you look at messaging that comes out of say Microsoft Engine or other sort of bits and places, the the viewpoint has shifted. Right, it, it's no longer everything must run on a on a Surface laptop. It's it's more. As long as you use our service, we're happy. And so everything is now a viable endpoint to Microsoft. You know, whether it happens to be a Windows machine or it's, uh, I think I saw some of the rage this morning because there's rounded corners on uh, Outlook for Windows. And uh, I saw somebody make the comment, um, great, I'm gonna have to go back to Outlook on Mac because um, it's got the, the UI that they prefer. For the record, I actually like Outlook on Mac. It actually handles pretty damn well, um, but, the fact that you've got viable working applications on like both platforms, it doesn't matter if you pick up a Windows or a Mac these yeah. days. I mean, I, I, 
makes it a lot easier but it also i i think it's also going to increase the, the chances you're going to run into a mac and you're going to have to very quickly decide what to do with it like it was easier three four or five years ago say oh. <laughs> we don't we don't support mac too bad so sad but now if that mac happens to be in the hands of the cfo and he gets hacked you've got a big problem in your hands you may not have a choice anymore to be frankly honest yeah and there's a lot of applications that utilize for windows that aren't mac based so you're trying like if you know logging applications don't always fit specifically for mac devices and adrs and stuff and that that complicates a lot mm. um it's a completely new stack to pick up that's for yeah sure. and it's 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 difficult to manage we have a client that's full mac like they're a healthcare provider okay ish and they're nothing but max and i'm like cool <laughs> yay um but part of the reason why i i would love to have a mac but i don't want to spend the apple tax it's too expensive to be able to buy a i can buy a windows machine for the same price that gives me better specs and it's, it's just not cost effective for me and what i do i i want one because... that is true oh well to an extent i mean i think some of the the m1 choices at least in the us market um ANZ in uk it's a little bit expensive right now but the m1s providing uh like price for performance for a 13 inch entry level macbook yeah but i think the price perform performance is sort of scaling the different way with the m1s i think you're seeing this sort of interesting trend with like go look at the pricing and say um maybe even, in a even... few years it'll be a good selling point but it's difficult to still to, to to still pay that tax when there's no real effective benefit from just going to apple because everything's Today, about yes but two three four years time from now i think it could be a vastly different story i mean i mean that depends you know we'll be using final cut pro and the web version and you have to have a safari web browser to use it i mean like it's that's what's where we're heading and at that point you could use a Chromebook. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a Chromebook on the Best Buy's website. It was a thousand dollars. Yeah, I don't understand that. And I, I don't like, see how that value. That's I don't I, see how that, I, the I concept that, of value with that escapes me. Yeah, I immediately did the dog thing of like, what? What? That doesn't make sense. It was nine ninety nine, and it had an i seven and sixteen gigs of RAM. And I was like, what's the point of a Chromebook? Um, but I mean, if you but, think about it, Chrome uses sixteen gigs of RAM just opening, so. It kind of makes sense that, that you'd need that BV of a processor to do that. And when Unreal Engine releases Unreal Engine 7 and Chrome only, you know, we might be... I mean, I mean, the one advantage is you, you, you don't have to think about it now. I mean, you know, personally, it's always interesting. But as a business, the beauty of this is you don't have to think about or worry about x 664 versus ARM64 architectures for at least a few years. Like the the industry will find you know find the right entry point and sort that out. But there will come an inflection where I won't be surprised if desktop laptop fleets eventually start shifting across. Maybe Qualcomm will finally get their decent answer to an ARM64 chip out there and align with with Microsoft. And therefore, you know, we won't have these SQ1, SQ2 problems that we do now, where it's it's not what it should be. Yeah. Surface Pro X should have been a good entry level machine with a good entry with a good chip. Kind of missed the part, but um, I like I have a Surface. So I like it. I mean, it's not like comparatively, I'm not buying another Surface to replace it. I'm buying a laptop because my needs have evolved from when I initially had that one. But I, it's it's a great little setup. And Ray, if you can buy a two thousand dollar iPad Pro. Uh, I'm not still going to buy a Chromebook. Like <laughs> an iPad has like real apps and stuff and not just a glorified web browser. Okay. <laughs> and that's laying some smack down right there. Yeah. Um, I, are you talking about Apple business manager? Som I think they are. Som chap, Apple ABM. Um, but Apple also concerns me from the right to repair setup. Like my desktop's custom built my last, I have, I've custom built my desktop for years now. Like it's almost like a rite of passage. My son custom built his laptop or his desktop 
and there are laptops that are coming out that are custom built that you can assemble yourself you buy the parts you plug and play framework frame.work yeah intel framework that's right yeah. yeah um and stuff like that is going to be more common i think i think it's because it's coming to the point to where because if i'm looking for a laptop i don't need an i7 i'd like to get one if it's within my price range but i don't need it i'm mainly worried about ram and graphical specs hmm. because the the price for performance for the graphical requirements that i need to be met it's it's cost effective to go make sure that i'm getting a specific card right um how do you have all the fancy tech ray it's it's out of my budget otherwise i'd buy one too like 1500 bucks for the entry level but there i mean there's only two really sections that you can do yeah i want to i need a 15 inch i have a 13 inch for my surface pro but it's it's too small and i'm old I just actually got the new iPad Pro, the uh, the large one, and um, they've done good. It's a good package. Maybe also I'm just getting old. My eyes need <laughs> larger screens as well. But uh, so I've got two 4K well. monitors that aren't set to 4K. <laughs> They're set to 1440p because I'm old, <laughs> and I don't want to be like this trying to find stuff. Business yeah, the, I see in the chat now that Apple Business Essentials is actually a really kind of interesting package. Um, you see the, the chat sort of going back and forth. It's interesting, like when you break that thing down, um, the reveal, it's basically a entry-level MDM uh, with patch and config via profile attachment. And, it looks like iTunes, slightly advanced. But it's also... Like multi-tenant iTunes. Well, it's also like iCloud Plus subscription management as well. So you can go in there and say, I want to buy an iCloud Plus subscription for like this group of user and then also manage the devices that they finally get. Hmm. Like they're definitely targeting 100% Apple shops. Interesting. Um, I, I, I do want to buy a Mac at some point. It's just not, I'm not at the point in my career or life where I just want to want that much. Get a Mac Mini. Um, yeah, but that's like the poor man's Mac. No, not with the M1. I know. Neither was the i5s. They're still it's a super powerful unit. Um, but I, I would like because that I'm, I'm unfamiliar. Like I want a bit of Hackintosh, but they killed that because of the M1 chip. Um, uh, that's not true. That's not dead yet. Well, it, it will be dead when they stop supporting Intel chips. And in yeah, so you years. got about two, three years to still play. Yeah, it could be a year. It is Apple. I had a Hackintosh for like three years, so and I definitely did enjoy it. But then um, I wanted an Nvidia graphics card, so obviously that didn't work out so well. <laughs> when Apple decided that they'd uh, uh, say bye bye to Nvidia. Yeah, um, I mean, I I would purchase an Apple device. Um, I just don't have the budget for it. So I couldn't have budget to. Because it, it'd be a hundred percent a play machine, it wouldn't be a like I'm not transitioning completely to it. So, and I think it's important too. Like even even if it's just for like your own skilling up, or at least just learning how a couple of the basics work. Because the chances are these days you're going to run into a Mac or an Apple device are incredibly high. Like we, we're no longer in a world where you have religious wars over Apple versus Android or PC versus Mac. It's more. Oh, I, beg I think this is where it gets, it gets gets interesting too. Oh, I beg like, the dipper. Have you not been on the internet? Well, I, I don't know. I, I, I keep encountering more people that they don't care what the OS is. They don't care about the tech as much as like, can I do my thing? Fantastic. That's their value. And which is a little bit sad because like, you know, I grew up to like building my own machines and, and the joy of going through and, and customizing a rig, but it's a nice to have. It's no longer become like, that's the way you should build a quality machine anymore. And so, yeah, it's getting more <laughs> to plenty of Kool-Aid drinking Apple users. Fantastic, Gavin. <laughs> and he's not wrong, but there's, that's on both sides too. Um, there's, there are some uh, Microsoft fanboys who are full Microsoft. Uh, I won't name any names. Um, all day, every day. So it, it goes back and forth. Like I, I would use it I, until 
it becomes a requirement, I probably won't use Apple device unless I just happen to find a good deal on one, I guess. Um, but that'd be my only thing. That makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, are there any actual real questions <laughs> instead of us just talking <laughs> for the last 30 minutes? Making our own questions just in conversation. That's how we got the chat talking about Apple. <laughs> Just we start talking about Apple and buying stuff, and then the chat wakes up and they're like, Yeah, give me everything. But, uh, it it actually kind of blows my mind that you can now actually rent uh, Apple virtual machines on AWS now out of EC2. I'm, I'm waiting for the time that uh, Azure also contemplates adding that to their catalog. Interesting. I wonder how that's going to work with the M1. Because I think part of Apple's thing is is specifically so they can get out of everyone else's ecosystem and it can just be the Apple ecosystem. And by providing support for those VDIs, that means Hackintosh could live forever or until Apple makes Apple Cloud. Excuse me. Well, they can't call it iCloud because that exists. What would they call it? I mean, the current the, the current business offering is iCloud Plus. <laughs> So that's that. If you wanted to get into Apple's data center, you, you'd subscribe to iCloud Plus. Yes. Okay. Then like that's just... that's the interesting part of the Business Essentials package. Actually, is that it's iCloud Plus is the the storage plus the MDM tool on top. It's just horrible. It's like a certain vendor who doesn't do well with naming iCloud just... Plus. Yeah, just keep the naming straightforward. <laughs> Is the future small boutique MSPs? No. I think the the, the future is. I, I think that's actually reality now. Is is there's there's room there's more room than ever for boutique MSPs because they don't require millions of dollars in investment to deliver services and product based on things like it, it becomes very easy for me to turn around and get a recommendation algorithm off the shelf from AWS or deliver a VDI through Node.io. So I think that being able to turn a service around in a very quick, short period of time has made it easy for Boutique. But a lot of the, um, the heavy touch work still needs to exist. I think the space has simply just expanded a little bit more because it's now easy to... The, the basics are no longer hard to do. Yeah, I don't think twenty that, years um, of experience and, and funding just to get a virtual machine up and running. Now you can now go focus on the next big problem to solve. Yeah, they'll exist. They'll exist as long as the MSP space um, is around because of the way managed services are kind of just there. Um, by the way, we formed it's just one guy managing someone's network, and then it's another network, and then it's another network, and that's just how managed services kind of starts up. And it's it's not a until you get bought out or you quit and decide not to do it anymore. You know, it, it's, it, they'll be exist, but they'll, they'll still, it'll be, if anything, it'll be more consolidated. Um, there's a lot of huge M&A going around because it's easier for me to buy you out than it is for me to grow yeah, my business. But, but, but I think it's, I, I think that's just a, another, another exercise of another cycle. Like, um, same in the tech industry where you have large scale vendors, massive consolidation, then followed by massive expansion of new companies. Like right? storage just went through a cycle. Um, DevOps and software firms are sort of going through their part. And obviously, IT management tools are also having some interesting cycles as well. Um, yes, MSP is going through a lot, but I think also representative too is look at the average age of an MSP owner in the North America market. You're at that age now where it's like, hey, I've built a really good business of things for 20, 30 years. Should I be thinking about, I want to get to the next stage. Does that mean I need to merge? Do I need to acquire? Do I decide I, I actually want to go back to more of a lifestyle style business or, you know, other life changes that, that might potentially be in play? Um, I think kind of impact and simply just turn it into more cyclical nature. I, I, if anything, I actually think if I look forward to what potentially could be over the same next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, I actually think there'll be more boutique MSPs, but I think there'll be, you know, all this uh, consolidation point, will happen and we'll end up with more MSPs, MSPs at that point, though. They'll be glorified consultants. 
I mean, boutique business can be consultancy in a big way because it's easier. You're able to be more nimble with services. Yeah, but I don't necessarily think that it'll be a managed service provider. It'll just be a guy who does power apps, you know, power automate. Um, what she knows that it's like, you know, because managed services got out of cabling for machines. So they have a guy that does cabling <laughs> or they have a guy that does uh, something that they don't want to deal with. Like that's kind of they're the, the person who does cabling isn't managed services. The person who does printer is they're managed print services, but they're not managed services. Like just are they're in the area, but they're not the same. Um, well, it comes back to you know what you consider a traditional versus a non traditional service for an MSP. Yeah, small yes. uh, large MSPs do get small businesses. Oh yeah, I I definitely think that that occurs a lot. I mean, I think it's they're more picky with those small businesses, yes. but they do absolutely get them. I think it's one of the biggest powers you have as 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 a business is to be able to decide. Yeah, you know, that sort of inflection point when you look at like your occasional favorite posts of, like, I'm young enough and I'm also pre pre revenue. I think is the new term. Uh, where well, you'll accept any business so you can grow your MSP as fast as you can. But when you're in a state where you're profitable, you're stable, you're consistent, you can then decide. Are you um, a good fit? Yeah, is this what I want to be? And yeah, so it's not unsurprising. You, you will. I think MSPs or any size can can say that they want small business. I think it's more of a question: Is it the right fit? As you as you put it, is this yeah. the right kind of style we want? Or they'll you know turn around and say, "Hey, we're not going to do everything, but we'll do this one specific thing for you." Maybe it's a VoIP service. Maybe it's we'll resell yeah. your licenses, or maybe it's you know, well, you got to buy these three or four packages and that's it. But yeah, they can it, be more choosy. It, yes. Um, it it depends on several things, but yeah, they absolutely get them. They, I mean, we. I would consider us a large MSP, and we will absolutely take on small businesses. Where again, it goes back to, yeah, we'll take that on. Or you're not really a good fit for us, but we appreciate you reaching out. And that, that is that is a maturity level that everyone should strive to. <laughs> that said, too, um, just because large MSP might go and chase a small business, um, just in case it's just suddenly popped in your mind, but you're not saying it. Um, the zombie chap here. Like, I don't think that means that there's not room to still compete. I think if anything else, like smaller businesses prefer, you know, they either prefer more sp personal touch or like you say, specialization, they may want that. A larger MSP, it's going to be more expensive to consider how to not just bring a service that looks after a vertical, but they've got to maintain that, which means staff, training, resources, funding, equipment. And if you're already there in that space, maybe and that's what works for your area like um if you look at say something like atlanta atlanta's got some very interesting fintech financial processing firms down there there's a lot of very specific things like if you're an msp in that area knowing that space knowing pci ds sv3 knowing a whole bunch of other things is like you need that to enter that market at a minimum so i think the standard the specialization is simply just what does your area need more than anything else uh, vertical specialization is dependent on how your business is set up. Um, to be able to effectively manage how you how it should be managed, I think you should be in a team based system to where a team manages that vertical. Um, they'd be much more efficient at managing, and then your entire company managing all the verticals. Um, but it also depends on how specialized you are. If you are com if you're nothing but dental offices then having a team is your entire team right um but if you have dental offices and you have healthcare and you have car dealerships and you have municipalities and education that becomes much more difficult to manage from an, uh, a user perspective like because the your municipalities are going to have different requirements than your education will and they'll both be different than your healthcare, and it's it can be difficult to make sure that security is properly done on both of those and compliance is done on all of those. So it, it becomes much more difficult to manage the entire process over than just, you know, having to worry about one vertical. Yeah. So small MSP is just a team from a large MSP. Uh, it definitely can be. And in some cases, um, I mean, maybe as a small MSP, you're, you're a generalist or you're a specialist in like one area of the generalist plus the rest. But in other cases, like, but um, 
I look to say uh, there is there is actually a specific MSP I know done in Atlanta that they have like one team and all that team does is just back up and disaster recovery. Like that's their specialty. Like there's a team of three, four, and they deal with understanding um, how to deploy feeds and speeds and everything else. And then there's another team that just does DevOps. And there's another team that just does security. Another team just does sysadmin. So yeah, you could say that's literally it is they've just broken the work up into streams that align with more importantly, I think for some of those is they align with how they sell their services. Like the backup teams are not just selling backup. It's probably selling backup deer as a service. They're probably selling archive. They're probably selling compliance as a service and a variety of other things, but they're incremental add-ons to the core skill that that, that team offers. Yeah. And, and so can, like with projects, like you, as a small team to a large team, like a large MSB, like we have a projects team whose job is to, vet what we are recommending and implement what we recommend it, but they don't support it or help desk does. Hmm. So, and along with a proactive team, depending on what we're actually doing, but you know, so it's, it's, it's very easy to split off into teams, but you got to make sure that you're doing it correctly. Um, you can be a small MSP without verticals. It's super easy. Oh, I, I like the uh, the uh, the line in the sand right there. I don't think you can be a small MSP without vertical specialization and heavy-handed standardization. Too much to cover. So you're you're imagining a world where things matter. <laughs> um, unfortunately, you as an MSP don't always get the option, as especially the smaller you are, to say no. Because at the end of the day, it's not your money you're spending. It's the client's money. And you can go in and be like, all right, you're getting Sentinel-1, you're getting uh, Intune, you're getting the business premium licensing for your entire client base, you're getting X, Y, and Z, and you're doing this. And they'll just look at you and go, okay, thank you, and then you'll never speak to them again. You could be a large MSP with an even larger client, and they still dictate the terms to you. Yeah, it's, 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 <laughs> this, is, this is a problem that's shared across the spectrum. Yeah, it's not a... It's not a size issue at that point. It's your, it's not your money or your business decision. Um, if it, you have to present it in a way that makes it feel like you're doing your best to educate your client and that these are the right things to do. But at the end of the day, they'll be like, all right, well, I want it sent in a one, but I don't want to do it. It's kind of interesting though. Like, um, let, let's just pick on backup for a second. Um, one MSP I know that that's sizable enough that they can pull this off. They, they've made a very strategic decision to align with two uh, backup vendors because they'll have some clients that come through and say, we're picky, we're choosy, we only we don't like this vendor for whatever reason. And so they've got two different stacks of, of offerings across. They can do that. Of course, to sort of achieve that level means that you've got to understand both those technologies and both those vendors and both those stacks down to an nth degree. So, I mean, you can... You can get interesting with your standardization, but there's always a cost somewhere. You just got to decide: is this willing? Is is this enough to be sustainable to pull it off? It yeah, is all about risk management, risk visibility, and, and visibility. maintain it. But it goes back to: it's not your money, and it's not your business. And as much you that you can have the best relationship with a client, you can have the most. They can ask you what to name their kids. That level of trust. But at the end of the day, you're messing with someone's financial future and it's not, you have no vested interest in the business aside from collecting a paycheck at the end of the month. Um, and if, if there's any inkling that that's not the way they're planning to drive their business direction internally, they're not going to go with it, even though it may be best for them and it may be what they need to do. They're in charge and they get to make their own business decisions. You can advise all you want to, but as especially as a smaller MSP, you don't get to dictate terms. You, you're, must, you're much less likely to be able to dictate terms, um, even in your vertical. Now you can change your, you can become a consultant. I mean, you don't have, a, you don't have an actual vested interest. You want them to succeed, but if they close business tomorrow, that's sad for you. But you you still have other clients, I'd assume. Yeah, there's all there's, there's there's always there's always choices to be made somewhere. 
Yeah, I mean, you, there's a goal to make them as successful as they can possibly be. But you can only, like, even from an employee perspective, even if you go to your boss and be like, look, we should do this, this, and this, and they're like, all right, that sounds good, but never do any of it. Like, you have a vested interest because you work there daily. Like, that's how you get your money. But at the end of the day, you don't get to call the shots unless you're the CEO. And this is kind of a bad example. <laughs> Yeah, I think with the line in the sand, though, is like, I, I can see the, the point Gavin's making with, like, if they go cheap, yes, but I think that's a little bit different from, like, the, the, the standardization you choose. Like, you choose a standardization not because, like, you believe in the tech or you think it's going to solve the, uh, the, the problem in the right way, but, um, you know, it's stable and reliable and it fits within your definition of what a well-running, delivered service should be, because, again, at the end of the day, you are a managed service provider. Your service isn't just the, the kit. It's everything required to operate it and secure it and maintain it so yeah when it comes to like a a, a cost problem that thing comes back to yeah sometimes you're, you you may need to say no on that regardless of what marketing says you are not a partner with your vendors you are a customer i understand you may want to be a partner and that sounds better than being a customer but at the end of the day you pay them a fee for them to deliver a service you're not their partners, even though they're marketing yells. Actions speak louder than words. That too. Partner is just a fancier way of saying customer. It's an, it's a marketing way of saying customer. To a point, language is more powerful than I think people give it credit. hundred um, percent. There's a reason why, you know, the, the Amazons of the world go out of their way to reinvent terms in order to rethink, reforce thinking and, and, um, the way people box themselves in onto certain things, you know, from little things like we don't call it username and password, we call it access access key and secret key, through to um, I'll use Dado for an example. You know, we have even internally we have to call everybody partners, and that's done for a very good reason because you it changes the thinking like oh you're not just another customer. What's in you know? Yeah. Top yeah. question I ask my colleagues is. Oh, we want to do X, Y, Z. Okay, what's in it for the partner? Answer that before I pick up the phone. Like the externally, you can then measure for this kind of thing, which goes back to like your vendor relationships. Is um, yeah, you can see you know partner in the marketing. Can you trace back the actions um, to see that clear execution, consistent execution of how um, things go with partners? Like Microsoft is a great example. Um, Every once in a while, you'll see like a really annoying you know, V dash email come through and try to cause you a little bit of disruption. But Microsoft's one of the f uh, foremost thinkers of we can't do business with our partners. Like Microsoft's always had that sort of inherent thinking in the back of their minds. And so you can sort of trace that through to certain actions and how they built things compared to, say, other vendors in the equal space there. So. Long story short, um, always yeah, okay. Yeah, you read the read the text. Always trace back to execution. Look at the the execution yeah. history. Um, to 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 go to Gavin's point about if a client closes down for a breach, if you did everything right and you absolutely nailed it, hmm. and they get breached and they close, what questions are you, are they going to ask? Who is their IT? What IT? Why didn't IT keep them protected? They're, they're still going to ask those questions if you did everything right and you spent a million dollars a month to protect them. The cloud business because the breach didn't really listen to you. Well, communications and audit trails are very, yeah, very you, important. That, what you, either not way, just the IRS. <laughs> yeah, either way, you're at a defensive posture, right? Because you're their IT company and they were breached. Why didn't they buy services? We offered them. They decided that they didn't do it. Okay, so I'm not getting sued because we tried to get them to do it the right thing. We did it. Okay, maybe I get sued now because I did the right thing. <laughs> yeah, but it's um, like, you know, let's let's say the breach happens. You don't walk in the next day and say, hey, I told you so. Like, that's that's yeah. not, yeah, that would instantly get you, a, well, now I'm definitely going to sue you response for sure. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's either you're a it's consultative a defensive... approach. You're, you're at a defensive posture if your client gets breached, regardless of what you did and how you did it. Because you're def you're going to defend your reputation, you're going to defend your... Uh, 
yeah, it's 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 it's, it's always IT's you, fault. Either you did action, everything right and it's IT's fault, or you didn't do everything right and it's IT's fault. It's your actions still matter. I think they st- the uh, the actions yes. and language and the, and more importantly, the language you use matters. Like um, but if a breach happens and a client, get, let's say a client closes down for business, someone's getting sued for a, depending on what that breach is. And mm. if you're not listed in that suit, that always that will always explain better the, your reputation than anything else with. Because if it's brought up in any meeting, you have the client. Well, you're right; they did close down, um, but unfortunately, but fortunately, we did everything we could to prevent the issue. We offered them everything they should have done right. Um, they went out of business due to their own personal neglect, and you know you can always try to explain it away, but you'll always have that reputation. It's like the it's like it's a nightmare scenario for anyone anyone getting breached because you're at you're always at a loss you're always starting from behind regardless if you did everything right or did everything didn't. I think it's more people are more willing to to understand and show empathy and forgive, um, especially within the first twenty four hours of a, a major incident, whether it be like physical, um, logical or otherwise. Like sh- sh- as long as you're showing that I do agree with that, Kevin. You you did what you, you did what was necessary. Like you look at um, maybe it's something along the lines of the data center burnt down, or yeah. the warehouse burnt down with a whole bunch of things in it. It was because like power to search the wrong way. Like okay, look, we took these actions. We did what we could. Life happened. You, yeah, or um, probably you know the most recent example in the last twelve hours. Um, Huntress Labs put out a very interesting post. Uh, if it, you know, people likely would have seen ABC one two three exclamation point exclamation point exclamation point. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they did turn around and very quickly say, "Here's everything we did, and here's why we did it, and here's how you can draw." And therefore, it's it, it's implied here. Here's how you can draw a stable conclusion about the state of the business and the, and the state of affairs from that point going forward. Like that's the level of the deliberate choice of language. The timing and the transparency and account and, and, and self accountability in that is like the kind of thing that you obviously Huntress Live has done the right thing and, and set a stage for the MSP uh, community and, and yeah, the vendor yeah, land and how that should be done. But like you could take that same style and approach and apply that to how you respond to an incident at a client and helping the client out and like that. Yeah, exactly. That does build trust. It, it, it builds trust and, and, and accountability and establishes a foothold that makes a difference that carries on to the next client and the next prospect. So, yeah, it's just very careful understand, understanding of the optics and understanding of the power of language and timing definitely makes a huge difference. And, and they basically put their money where their mouth was because they've always touted this. And then they were breached. Uh, and then boom. Well, breach is a strong word. Uh, they had an incident. That's like an isolated test environment. We get it. Yeah. Um, and they they went they did everything they said that anyone else should do if, if they had an incident. And that is strong, powerful words. I love Huntress. I uh, I take all of Kyle's exploits as my own because I am a Kyle. <laughs> and it is our right. Not bad, not bad. I think you just muted yourself. Did I? Oh, there you are. Okay. I have a noise gate, so sometimes it makes it sound like I press the mute button. Ah. Uh. Um. To, also, to point out that while I believe Gavin is right, not everyone has the ability to to remove clients, even though they probably should. An important life lesson writing that one right there and running a business i suppose yep are you is, is this risky enough for me to make some money off of <laughs> get in make some money get out no absolutely true absolutely true all right um so what is now your clock i think we should yeah. now call it we have been going for two hours and it has been a very fun trip it absolutely has, and definitely enjoyed the uh, the dialogue in the chat. Yes, uh, I have. Uh, when we first spoke at Datocom, uh, the MSP Geek watch party for all the stuff, um, I didn't think having a 
Venderon would be beneficial, but it definitely has been. Um, it's a different side of the take that I don't think many people normally get. Um, and you being a vendor, you're tainted because you're a vendor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, where's my dad? I should be right yeah, back. right. Uh, and it's it's interesting getting another perspective, especially one who's working so closely with a lot of the stuff we utilize uh, and where, you, where where we're headed as a market, because you do have a unique perspective heading into um, where we're where the MSPs are moving to. I mean, you are building our tool sets like daily, and it's it's interesting to to, to get your perspective. So I extremely appreciate you. Uh, joining us and, and hanging out with us for a couple of hours on this beautiful Wednesday. No, I think I think the biggest thing is is that, and I think this what makes it unique in a, out of all the IT spaces. Um, like Infosec's got its own quirks, so does enterprise and mid market. I think what helps is MSP communities stay open because they realize that that's the best way. It, it's it's more beneficial to be open and straightforward with each other. Um. And I think that kind of thing, that's the thing that resonates with me personally. Just be honest, be true, and just say what you mean. Yeah, I, that, I that makes a huge difference. And, and so it, it's, it's good seeing new people coming into the MSP Geek community as a result and you know, all the other communities as well, because they don't matter. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, no, it's great. I mean, we, we have, a have had a lot of dialogue with a lot of different communities and people who run different communities. And it's, it's always fun to, to get different perspectives because we're all IT people and we're all a lot of introverted and unless we're drunk at a con, uh, conference or something and being able to have conversations to change your perspective is, is super beneficial because everything's different. Right. And it's, it's exactly. important to to properly manage yourself and to to pull yourself out of your silo. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. I think that probably puts us in a good place to close off for tonight. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to hit the end stream button. It's probably not going to properly work, but I'll fix it so the music comes back on. So uh, thanks again, everybody, and I hope you have a great night. Take it easy, everybody.